Hello, everyone. My name is Corey Padilla. Um, I'm the head of the scientific affairs at Dovetail Genomics. And today we're going to be looking at how the enhancer promoter interactome drives uh, neuronal cell differentiation and helps to contextualize Alzheimer's associated polymorphisms. So a brief outline of what we're gonna be talking about today, we're gonna to do a brief introduction into chromatin conformation um, and the interactome data type. Uh, then we'll dive into a case study where we look at cellular differentiation from uh, iPSC, uh, um, induced pluripotent stem cell, into a neuronal stem cell and how topology plays a role in driving that development. Um, and then we'll end on how you go about integrating these types of interactome data into your research. So with that, let's get started on our introduction. So many approaches to genomics today result in a very linear view of the genome. So here, the, the image I'm showing at the top are uh, genomic variants that are visualized on a reference genome where your uh, genome is pretty much a straight line and you're looking at how the different genomic components can be rearranged on that um, landscape, that linear landscape. The other version of this sort of linear view um, revolves heavily around you know, regulation and building these uh, models about how different genes are turned on and off and how that regulatory landscape works. And um, this work has very much been done through not just um, DNA sequencing, but you know, chip seek, attack seek, things like that build this very nice, powerful image of the linear genome, which is great. This has opened up uh, like many, many discoveries and helped us build really great models for how um, uh, various diseases and how developmental uh, programs work and things like that, but it's not the full picture. And we know that because genomes are not organized in a straight line. If you think about the human genome, there's about three meters of DNA in each cell that has to be compacted inside of a nucleus, right? And it's not just kind of packaged in a random format. There is a hierarchical structure to that, starting with chromosomal territories at, at the larger scale in the nucleus, if you can talk about large scale um, in, inside of a nucleus. And then um, from there, it kind of gets clustered into these open um, and closed compartments or A and B compartments where a compartments tend to be more active or uh, transcriptionally um, active, and B components are relatively silent chromatin that don't um, that aren't involved in gene expression. And then within these two compartments, there's a, another uh, set of compartments called these TADs or topologically associating domains, where clusters of linked function genes kind of get grouped together through CTCF mediated. Um, chromatin extrusion and folding and things like that. And then even further, there are um, chromatin loops that are often associated with enhancer promoter interactions where the enhancer engages with the promoter and recruits the right uh, transcriptional, transcriptional machinery to then kick those genes on. And so one of the things that we found is that confirmation, this hierarchical folding really helps us make this leap from this linear view of the genome into this 3D folded structure that helps us understand exactly which enhancer is engaged with what promoter and how that can describe um, the regulatory landscape of a, of a genome, right? And so that 3D structure, that interaction, that confirmation, um, we refer to as the interactome because the way that we look at these data are asking what parts of the genome are interacting with each other. And that interaction um, frequency is reflected uh, in the, the folding that we see in the genome. So how do we capture that information? Well, um, it's through the, the world of chromatin confirmation capture. The, the core workflow of chromatin confirmation capture has been around for a long time. This is known as 3C. Um, there are many uh, offshoots that have come up from that core workflow, 
but the core workflow was pretty um, stable throughout all the different flavors. So uh, you first start with cross-link chromatin to fix the, the chromatin and that 3D orientation. And then you go in and fragment that chromatin. Historically, that's been done with restriction enzymes. And um, towards the end of this talk, we'll tell you why that might not be the best approach and how you can kind of get a better view of topology by not using a restriction enzyme to fragment. Once you have those uh, digested fragments, then you go ahead and tell ends to ligate. And how those ligations occur um, are based on the 3D structure. So you're going to ligate not, ne not necessarily what's next to you in linear space, you're going to ligate with something that's close to you in three-dimensional space. Um, and then you reverse those crosslinks, and what you have left is a chimeric molecule where that junction is reflective of um, an interaction in, in that 3D space between uh, the genome. And so, like I said, there are many different offshoots that we could uh, take to look at this. Uh, the two that we're really going to focus in on today um, are these, this high C approach where you biotin that ligation event, you pull down and then make a uh, sequencing library out of that and look at all of the interactions throughout the genome. The next one is that Chia Pet, um, also known as high chip approach, where we add a chromatin immunoprecipitation. So we're going to pull down on a protein of interest and then ask what the interactome looks like from the viewpoint of that particular protein. Um, and the result of these uh, approaches looks like this. So remember that chimeric molecule that we said that we put a biotin on? Um, that's what we're kind of uh, highlighted in in the circle. And that, that molecule, when it gets sequenced, it has read one and read two, like you would sequence on an Illumina, Illumina instrument. In this, uh, though, where read one aligns to one part of the genome and read two lines, uh, lines some distance away. And that distance that it aligns away is, again, reflective of that fold. So we're bringing that in these contact matrices where each point in the matrix represents um, a read pair that are, are two regions of the genome that are interacting. And then the color um, or brightness of that spot is reflective of how many reads are supporting those uh, two loci interacting. And so when we take a look at this in, in real data, this is what it looks like, where we can start seeing regions that are interacting more substantially with each other than with other parts of the genome. So those little triangles that you see kind of close to the x-axis there, that's genomic position, um, those are tads. Those are topologically associated domains where there are more interactions within those regions than across those regions. Um, so this is how we visualize the interactome. We can visualize the interactome in another way by looking at them through these contact arcs, where um, at the top there, I'm showing you the read pair alignment to the reference genome. And then to the bottom left, what I'm showing is how those read pairs would reflect in these contact arcs, where you can see a stronger signal happening between region one and region three than there is between region one and region six. Now this is equivalent to those contact matrices that I'm showing on the bottom right, where again, you see the bright spot that's reflective of more contacts um, and the duller spots reflective of fewer contacts. Um, the, the arc visualization is a hallmark of high chip data uh, that we'll be getting to later on. And the contact matrix is more commonly used in things like high C, omni C, and micro C, which is what we're going to start our case study on. So now that we all kind of know, you know why we should be thinking about the 3D genome, why we sh why uh, the interactome kind of brings that importance to gene regulation and how we visualize that, let's dive into our case study here, which is really looking at the, uh, the regulatory interactome between um, an iPSC cell that's been induced into a neuronal stem cell. And so I want to start this case study with a very familiar image. This is the Waddington landscape, where um, at the top you see that pluripotent stem cell, right? That's the one genome that all of the, the cells in our bodies have. But as cells develop or as your body develops, right, these cells 
can kind of get moved into different valleys into this Waddington landscape. And that's largely driven by epigenetic changes through methylation, through acetylation, through different types of chromatin folding, things like that. And so as different epigenetic modifiers occur, you can have that, that one genotype give rise to many different phenotypes. This is differentiation, which we've highlighted on the arrow on the left-hand side of that image. Now, the other way to think about it is that you could reprogram cells by trying to uh, re-induce pluripotency um, and having them move back up the uh, Waddington landscape to the original um, pluripotent cell, cell type. Um, but it's this sort of, you know, model where you start with one genotype and through these epigenetic modifications, you can have many different phenotypes. That's kind of the, you know, the central dogma of, um, uh, of development and, and how cells can change from uh, one genotype into these various cell forms. And so the question that we really want to drive at today is what role does chromatin conformation play in uh, development and cellular differentiation? And so to that end, we have this model where we have induced pluripotent stem cells, and then we have, um, then we've uh, forced those uh, iPSC cells to become neuronal stem cells or NSCs. And so uh, and which those uh, NSCs can then be further uh, developed into astrocytes, neurons, or oligodendrocytes. And so we're really going to focus in on the difference between those IPSC, those pluripotent stem cells, and the neuronal stem cells. So just the, the kickoff between uh, differentiation into that neuronal cell type. And to look at this um, model system, we have generated uh, RNA-seq data, so we're going to look at the actual um, transcriptional activity of these two cell types. We have CHIP-seq uh, to look at the um, enhancer promoter repertoire um, and some of the key uh, pluripotent maintenance factors um, of these two, some, uh, these two cell types. And then we have our Omni-C to be that high-C approach. Um, to look at genome-wide contacts, and then we're going to dive into the high chip, which is the protein-directed view of the interactome. And finally, we're going to take some GWAS data um, that's uh, been linked to Alzheimer's, and we'll try to contextualize what those um, variants are in terms of the regulatory landscape, um, which is actually a really exciting thing to do with this particular data type. And so I'm just highlighting here that it, it has been shown in previous work that chromatin interaction changes can account for a significant um, portion of uh, cellular differentiation. So we really want to target our question here about what's really going on between the iPSCs and the NSCs. So the first thing we're going we're to do is look at the, um, the RNA-seq and see what the, the regulatory uh, landscape is between these two cells. So what we have here is a go analysis of the um, RNA-seq data, of the differential expression between the NSC and the IPSC. Now what I've done is I've colored um, the, the uh, columns in this dot plot to reflect whether or not they are um, a developmental function, which is that sort of yellow orangish color, or if they're a specific, specific neuronal um, function that's been upregulated in the NSCs. So what we can see here across the board is that most of the functions that are upregulated in the NSCs uh, cells are associated with either developmental functions or neuronal functions um, as compared to the IPSC cells, which are mostly just cellular maintenance and pluripotency maintenance, um, which all goes to show that our model system is in fact behaving as our model system should, right? This is just kind of confirmation um, that our, our system is working properly. The next thing that we wanted to ask is, you know, of the key pluripotency maintenance factors, what um, is the activity of those factors between the two cells? So here we're looking at NANOG, OCT4, uh, and SOX2. All of these are critical to the maintenance of that stem cell um, uh, type, right, where uh, it has the potential to be differentiated into many different cell types. 
Um, and what we can see here is that in between um, the IPSC, which are the blue circles and the blue coverage uh, profiles, and uh, the NSC, which are the red coverage profiles, um, sorry, I got, I need to close my email. We're going to have to edit that out. Blah. No problem. Let me go ahead and um, make a quick note for editing. Give me one second. Yeah, and I just closed my email so that won't happen again. My bad. Okay. No worries. One sec. Okay, good. I didn't know we can definitely get an update before end of the day. Okay. And this is just okay. to confirm slide 14. Awesome. Yeah, I'll I'll take slide 14 from the top. Okay, one more second. Do you have a document where I can include the studio information kind of like we did last time? Okay, perfect. All right, we'll go ahead and just give it a few seconds and then you can start at the top of slide 14. Okay, so the next thing that we wanted to ask um, of this uh, model system is, what is the activity of the pluripotency maintenance factors um, between these two cell types? So here we're uh, doing chip seek for Nanog or against Nanog, Oct4, and SOX2. All of these um, factors are critical to the maintenance of uh, the pluripotency. So it's it's all about maintaining that ability for the iPSC cells to be able to differentiate into other cell types. Um, and so what we can see here across the board um, for each one of these factors is that in the iPSC cells, which is the blue circle and the blue coverage, um, that these factors are fairly active and highly um, engaged across the entire genome. Whereas in the NSC, which is the red circle in the Venn diagrams or the red coverage plot, that these factors are pretty much absent or uh, severely reduced in their activity across the genome. So this is a second piece of confirmation here that the, the system that we're working in is actually behaving as we expect. So I'm breaking here, but it's nice to know that our uh, model system is behaving like our model system. So the next thing that we really want to start diving into is how does topology, how does that interact on data type, help us make sense of um, what's going on with these particular factors. So to that end, we're going to focus in on Nanog just for the case of this, um, this little case study here. Uh, there's a lot more to dive into, but we're going to really narrow our view here on what's going on with Nanog. And so the first thing that we wanted to do is ask what is the uh, compartment structure look like between the iPSC and the NSC cells. Now, if you remember back to our initial introduction to conformation, uh, there is open uh, chromatin, which is usually an A compartment, or inactive or silent chromatin, which is normally a B compartment. And so what I have plotted on the left are the AB compartment scores, rather the open closed scoreness of uh, the iPSC and NSC across chromosome 12. And just visually looking at these two um, sort of uh, score maps, we can see that there are uh, differences in how these uh, matrices actually look. But it becomes a lot clearer when we just look at the eigenvector, which is the key score across the matrix that tells us whether or not it's in an A or B compartment. Um, across the uh, length of chromosome 12. So if you move to the right, I've blown up the eigenvector plot there at the bottom, and I've uh, annotated the y-axis to uh, show if it's above zero, it's an open or active chromatin score, and in the uh, if it's below zero, then it's a closed or inactive score. So these uh, regions are going to be less transcriptionally active. And so what you can see is as you go along uh, chromosome 12 here that there are clear shifts between um, the NSC and IPSC cells where there are regions that uh, are open in the IPSC cells and closed in the, um, the NSC cells and vice versa. But particularly what I want to point out here is NANOG, which is that dashed line very early on on chromosome 12. And what we can see is that um, in the NSC cell type, Nanog actually occurs now in silence chromatin, 
where in the iPSC cells, it occurs in an open chromatin region. So that kind of goes to show that um, the compartment structure around Nanog uh, already kind of sets us up on the scale that, or on, on the notion that um, Nanog activity, the, the transcription of Nanog, is going to be severely reduced in the NSC cells because it occurs in now a B compartment and now occurs in that silent chromatin region. So next, we wanted to zoom in um, on the region around Nanog and look at domains. What is the domain structure, those TADs, those linked function uh, clusters, um, particularly around Nanog? So first, we ask from a genome-wide standpoint, what does the TAD structure look like between the iPSCs and NSC cells? So what I have plotted on the left um, is just the total number of TADs that have been called at 25 KB resolution. And we can see that iPSC cell, uh, cells contain more TADs, right? There, uh, there's slightly over 4,000 TADs, where in the NSCs, there are um, less than 4,000 TADs being called. So these are unique domains um, that, are, uh, that have higher degree of interaction within the domains rather than across domains. So what about the size of these domains is different between these two cell types? So uh, the next plot we have, the box and whisker plot, is the TAD size in uh, kilobases between the iPSC and NSC cells. And what we can see is on average, the iPSC cells contain smaller TAD sizes than the NSCs. So while um, NSC sees TAD numbers go down, the actual TAD sizes increase. Right, so you're getting these bigger clusters that are encapsulating more uh, linked function genes within a domain where that interactome is going to be um, more frequent than you are seeing in the NSC, which has smaller, more broken down uh, TAD structures. And now if we specifically ask the question, what is the TAD structure around Nanog? Um, that's what I have plotted on the right here where we can see the um, interactome, that's the heat map for both IPSC and NFC, and the TAD boundaries, which are those blocks that are being plotted uh, across chromosome 12. And right where Nanog um, lives, uh, which is the dotted line here, we can see that there is a TAD boundary that flanks uh, Nanog. So in, um, in the IPSC, Nanog occurs within a TAD. And in the NFC uh, cell type, that TAD is now missing. That domain of uh, increased interactome is, is gone. Um, so that's, you know, a, another line of evidence here that the topology specific to Nanog is actually quite different between these two cell types. Now, these first two lines of evidence are really great to point at kind of larger structures in what um, driving the Nanog uh, uh, transcription signal. But it doesn't really tell us too much about what the specific enhancer promoter interactome looks like um, around Nanog. So now the next thing that we want to do is zoom in on uh, the, the region of the genome that um, is really focused in on Nanog. So that's what we've done here. And so uh, we've plotted out the OmniC data type for the IPSC, which is going to be on the left, and the NSC, which is going to be on the right. Below that, we have uh, the RNA-seq coverage tracks um, in blue. And then in red, that's uh, H3K27 acetylation chip seq data uh, for uh, the enhancers. And then in green below that, we have H3K4 trimethylation data, which is the active promoter marks. Um, and then below that, we have the genes. And so what I've done in the blue box is uh, kind of uh, called out where the nanog promoter lives. And what I want to point out first here is that the interactome data on the top and that contact matrix, what we can see is that in the iPSC cells, there is an enrichment of contacts, right? We see more bright pixels in the region around Danog, where in the NSC data side, we're not seeing those contacts. Those contacts have pretty much been obliterated. Um, and then if we go down and look, what we can see is in that blue box, as we go down, we can see that Nanog is transcriptionally active in IPSC, which is good, we should see that. Um, and then we see uh, that the enhancer marks, um, sorry, the promoter marks, the bottom in green there, 
are active in IPSC, but largely missing, right? There's no um, green spike in that blue box for the NANA promoter. So that promoter is no longer considered active. Moreover, what we can do here now is we can see that in the red box um, through the interactome, we can link the that particular enhancer mark as being the strongest interaction with the um, nano promoter in the IPSC. And also that particular enhancer mark is missing in the NSC um, data type. So through this, we can now actually say, not only are the contacts um, are missing, between the uh, between Nanog and the enhancer promoter, but the the whole enhancer promoter landscape is quite different at Nanog, um, uh, at IPSC than they are at NSC, and so this is really great. But the other thing that we're still kind of missing here is from the enhancer and promoter viewpoint, what is really the key interaction that is being lost here between the IPSC and NSC. And so to address this, we're going to be looking um, at high chip data. That's that protein directed interactome. And uh, as I mentioned earlier in the core workflow, it's gonna start with those cross-linked cells. We're gonna perform the fragmentation. We use MNAs to do this. Then we conduct our chromatin amino precipitation. Uh, with our antibodies. Then from there, we perform that proximity ligation where we make those chimeric molecules that are reflective of that long range information, reverse those cross links in sequence. The resulting data type here um, captures that DNA protein binding site. So on the, the blue line, I'm showing ChIP-seq data for CTCF. In the green track below that, I'm showing um, high chip uh, data where we're able to recapitulate those chip seek peaks in the high chip data. And then um, below that, we have those contact arcs that I were describing earlier that shows how these peaks are actually interacting with the surrounding genome. So we can see places of very strong interaction and places of very weak interaction. So what we've done is we've taken these IPSC and the NSC cell types, and we've done high chip on these cells for um, enhancers, promoters, and the CTCF chromatin boundaries. And this is what we see when we look at NANOG. So the first two tracks in this, um, this plot here are uh, H3K27 acetylation. This is the enhancer marks. Below that in green, we have H3K4 trimethylation marks for the active promoters. And then we have CTCF um, peaks in red below that. And then what I'm plotting in the track immediately below that is the uh, log fold change of gene expression. So where the, you see blue blocks, those are genes that are more expressed in iPSC cells than in NSC cells. Okay, so this kind of seems a little messy. There's a lot going on in this plot, but it's really informative. And I'll, I'll show you why. So, so if we think just about the enhancer promoter interaction. What I've highlighted here in the orange box is that not only is there a loss of enhancer prom enhancers and promoter marks, there is a uh, very specific loss of interaction between the enhancers and the promoters at uh, the NANOG uh, gene site. So, this is showing us that it's these particular um, enhancer marks. Um, so if we look at the top track and the H3K27 acetylation, we can see that there's an enhancer mark that has two arcs being drawn over. Then if we go down to the first green track, we see a promoter mark with two um, arcs that are uh, hitting the spot where the enhancer uh, lives. So we can now definitively say that it is that enhancer that's engaged with that promoter site in uh, IPSC cells that's driving the transcription of uh, NANOG. And then in the IPSC, we lose those contacts. So there is an enhancer that occurs uh, slightly upstream of NANOG, but we can see that that arc uh, is being forced away from the NANOG promoter. So that enhancer is actually not engaged with the NANOG promoter. Um, so that's how powerful this data type is. So you might be able to see shifts in enhancer promoter marks, but now you can actually say which direction those enhancers or promoters are engaging with the surrounding genome. So even though we see an enhancer mark for um, the NSC near NANOG, it's actually not engaged with the NANOG promoter at all. 
Um, next, if we look at just the chromatin boundaries, these CTCF, we can see that in IPSC, right, we see that TAD structure, the, the loops between the CTCF occurring that are missing in IPSC. And moreover, there are sub TAD boundaries or sub loops uh, where those interactions are being lost in the IPSC. So um, if you remember the image that we saw in the last uh, or two slides ago with the contact matrix and how those um, interactions are just obliterated, we now have confirmation through the CTCF viewpoint um, of that. And we also have a very powerful data type that tells us exactly what enhancer is engaged with what promoter to turn Nanog on. Um, so that's really one of the very powerful things that this data type brings to the table. And so what we've just done with that high chip data is essentially we've annotated what enhancer is engaged with what promoter. Now, if you're uh, thinking about an epigenetic standpoint, that, that's very powerful. But what if you don't have chip seek data? What if you have a bunch of GWAS information um, and variants that you know are linked to a disease, but you don't know exactly what they're doing? Well, this interactome data type is very powerful to help annotate those GWAS variants. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take the, um, the NSC uh, chip seek and high chip, uh, high chip data for enhancers and GWAS identified Alzheimer's SNPs. So in the blue uh, coverage that I'm plotting here, that's uh, uh, enhancer chip seek coverage across chromosome 19. And then below that in red are the positions of Alzheimer's associated SNPs. Um, and in that dotted line where you see that very strong um, red signal for the, the variants, that is, uh, those are SNPs that are occurring around APOE, which is known to be uh, very strongly correlated with Alzheimer's. And so what we did is we went in and we, we zoomed in on that APOE region and we plotted the ChIP-seq um, uh, coverage, which is what is the uh, first track uh, of blue coverage in the blow up. And then uh, below that, we have all the promoter regions that are occurring um, in that region. And I've colored APOE green. Then below that, we have the high chip contact arcs, right? What is, uh, what are the enhancers actually um, engaged with? And so if we just ask the question around the, um, what, what interactions are occurring with APOE, I've colored those contact arcs green. And so what you can then go is go in and say what enhancers in that landscape are actually engaged uh, with APOE. So now what we can do then is go into the SNP data that again, those are the, the red uh, plots or the red bars in the, um, the plot at the very bottom. We can now go in and say that any of these SNPs that are occurring over these um, APOE enhancer regions could actually be um, engaged with APOE. So even though it doesn't occur, even though, though these variants don't occur directly at the APOE promoter or gene body, that they are occurring telobases away, that these SNPs could actually impact the ability for um, that acetylation to occur and therefore destroy a enhancer promoter interaction that is critical for APOE's function. So it's you know taking this interactome data and applying that enhancer promoter sort of annotation to SNP promoter annotation, and we can actually have a more accurate view of what these SNPs are doing for um, disease-linked variants. So uh, just briefly, I want to go over a summary of the findings that we we've had so far. So. Uh, what we've shown is that the regulatory programs that drive neuronal development from these induced pluripotent stem cells into um, the neuronal cell type can be linked to both very large scale topology features and very fine scale topology features. And that of those fine scale uh, features, we can actually go in and identify the specific enhancer promoter interactions at Nanog that are driving um, the the loss of that transcriptional uh, program in uh, NSC cells that leads to the loss of pluripotency that allows for the neuronal cell type to start developing. Um, and then, you know, finally, we showed that the interactome um, 
expands the ability to annotate these variants and has actually a large implication for not just reassigning a SNP, but also to maybe rescue some of these uh, BUSs, these variants of unknown significance. So we know that many of these variants occur in non-coding regions. Well, uh, we actually have a means by which we can link those non-coding regions to coding regions. And when we apply the um, enhancer viewpoint or promoter viewpoint to those interactions, we can actually start annotating these variants of unknown significance. So it's a very uh, powerful data type to bring into your studies. So which leads us to the last part of this talk, which is how do you go about integrating the interactome um, into your research? So here at Dovetail, um, our core technology that enables us to do everything from genomic analysis all the way into the interactome um, analysis is this proximity ligation, that core workflow that I talked about in the introduction, where cells are cross-linked to preserve that 3D interactome uh, structure. We fragment the genome, and then we uh, ligate those fragments back together based on three-dimensional um, proximity rather than linear proximity. And then we have that chimeric read that's biotinylated at that ligation site. We pull down on that molecule, and then we sequence that molecule. And then from there, there are a handful of flavors that you can um, do from this core workflow that Dovetail supports. So our first um, route is with OmniC. Now, this is an approach where we fragment the, uh, the chromatin using DNAs. And we do this in a manner that um, gives us very much uniform coverage of the genome. We can re recapitulate whole genome sequencing coverage through the use of DNAs in chromatin fragmentation. Um, so what I have here um, is the assay, the approach that makes it different from the other, um, uh, from that core workflow and what it results in. And so for OmniC, what we have is that whole genome um, sequence coverage that really opens up uh, proximity ligation data to do a whole genome sequencing things. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in depth in the upcoming slides. Our next approach is micro C, which uh, we use eminase to fragment the chromatin. And so this gives us uh, mono and dinucleosome fragments that we can go in and ask about what does the interactome look like from the viewpoint of a nucleosome. Um, this is really cool because it the the nucleosome is the building block to chromatin, and conformation works at the scale of chromatin. So we're able to look at the interactome from the viewpoint of a uh, nucleosome. Whereas with the OmniC approach, we're asking the viewpoint of the uh, interactome from a single base pair, um, which is more informative to uh, primary sequence, whereas the micro C is more informative over um, actual chromatin building blocks. And then finally, we have the high chip, which uh, enabled us to really identify which enhancers were engaged with what promoters, where we fragment with eminase, and then we go in and do the chromatin immunoprecipitation with an antibody of choice that gives us that protein-directed view of the interactome. So, um, now we're going to go uh, into a little bit more depth for each one of these particular products. So that uniform coverage of OmniC captures a more complete view of topology and expands the data utility. So what I'm showing here is a workflow where you take your sample. This could be tissue, blood, um, or cell material. And then you perform the OmniC assay. You sequence the data. And from there, you can do structural variant detection. You can do SNP and indel genotyping because we're getting whole genome um, sequencing coverage. And then you can use that information to reassemble genomes. So this is actually really powerful if you have you know, uh, cancerous genomes and you want to reassemble the genome instead of comparing it to the HD38 reference, you can build your own reference of your particular cancer. Um, and then because we're getting that whole genome coverage and able to capture the SNPs and, uh, and be able to genotype, we can now uh, phase haplotypes. So uh, this becomes really uh, powerful because the data span very long range information. So you can build uh, very large uh, phase haplotype blocks of regions that are coming from either mom or dad. 
Uh, and then finally, it can be used for chromatin confirmation, which is what the crux of the study that we showed here today. One of the really cool things that I do want to point out here is that because we have whole genome-like coverage in the OmniC assay, you can come in with a hybrid capture panel. So say if you have a pan cancer panel or you have a particular uh, promoter panel or um, you know it, really any panel that you want, you can throw that at the OmniC um, library, pull down, and then you don't have to sequence as deeply to ask very targeted questions about topology. Um, so if you have questions about that, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, we're very excited about this capability. We, we'd love to talk to people about it. The uh, next approach, like I mentioned, was the micro-C approach where we fragment with MNAs. And now this gives us that nucleosome-centric view of uh, topology. And so what this does is it allows us to capture the larger topology features like AB compartments, TADs, and uh, CTCF-mediated events like we, we really got into in that IPSC study. But it also allows us to then zoom in even further on the building blocks of chromatin to look at specific enhancer promoter um, interactions, even look at things like loop extraction, um, how, how uh, chromatin actually just engages and folds over top of each other that really helps regulate um, you know, gene expression. Like the one thing that pops to my mind is always bivalent chromatin. Um, it's a very unique aspect of our genome. It's really kind of hard to get at. And you can visualize bivalent um, interactions through this data type uh, very strongly. Um, not only does it allow us to view um, interactions at a much more uh, finite resolution, but it also uh, has a higher signal to noise because we're really stacking data over those nucleosomes. So for the features that you're trying to identify, like uh, enhancer promoter interactions or chromatin looping, we're getting more read support per feature, which is what I've highlighted there in the contact matrix. So in the circle is a uh, our loop calls, and then the numbers next to those um, uh, loop calls are the number of reads that are supporting those interactions. So if you look at different approaches to um, to capture topology, so micro C uh, and different restriction enzyme approaches, you can see that you're missing, or you, you either don't have a lot of read support for those calls, or that there's features that you're clearly missing in the contact matrix because you're really limiting your viewpoint to a restriction site rather than to a nucleosome. And then finally, um, the high chip approach here, which is again really about pulling down and ask a question about the interactome from the viewpoint of a protein of interest. So, um, you know, uh, the, the kind of, the big ones that people tend to go for are H3K4 trimethyl for active promoters, CTCF for chromatin boundaries, and then H3K27 acetylation for enhancers. So you can ask the question, what is engaged with my promoter or what is my enhancer engaged with if you go um, the, the methylation or the acetylation route. And finally, you can access all of these dovetail solutions through either kits or services. So our OmniC, our MicroC, and our High Chip are all available through a kit um, that is really easy to use and walks you from sample prep all the way through sequencing. Um, and then we also have analytical support um, that will help you align the data, process the data, and get you to uh, ask your biological question. We don't want you spending a lot of time thinking about data processing. We want you thinking um, heavily about what your biological question is and how you can um, address that. And so um, both our services and our kits are facilitated through um, a really great customer support team. And like I mentioned earlier, that computational guidance. Um, I spend a lot of time computing these data and it's a lot of fun and I love talking to people about what it is that they want to do with the data and how we can get them there. So. You know, if you have any questions about that, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. And with that, I would like to say thank you very much for listening in, and I will uh, gladly take any of your questions. Not only that, but I'll be in the booth. So if you have any, you know, technical questions or, you know, biological questions, or if you want to drill down on the IPSC story and you have some unanswered questions there, you know, um, I'll be there and am more than happy to answer any questions or we can set up a meeting after the, uh, the conference to discuss in more detail. So whatever works best for you all. And again, thank you very much.